Unit 4, the grasses. Section 3, points to ponder. Just some interesting information, uh, current information about uh, what's going on with uh, some of the grasses, um, different ways they're being used and different things that are being explored right now. Um, a very promising uh, area of research is this product called golden rice. Um, golden rice is a rice that contains vitamin A. And vitamin A is essential for eye health and uh, eye problems are prevalent in developing nations and nations that depend on rice as a primary food source because normally rice contains no vitamin A. This rice has been bred um, and uh, modified genetically uh, to produce vitamin A, which gives it that yellow color. Uh, there's still an issue in that in a lot of these uh, developing areas, um, white rice is still preferred, though inroads are being made. This map gives an idea of the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. It's huge. And notice that where there are severe to clinical shortages of vitamin A in people's diets are primarily in the developing nations. And many of these nations, particularly um, in Asia, are highly dependent on rice as a primary food source. So developing a product such as golden rice uh, could have an incredible effect on uh, eye health and um, the possibilities uh, seem endless. Um, grasses are also used as a feed for livestock. Now in the US we feed a lot of corn to cattle, but um, other grasses um, are fed in the grass state to livestock. When that is done, it's called forage. <clears throat> and there are a number of different grasses that have been developed specifically to be more nutritious for livestock, to um, be able to be stored in, in, uh, as hay, for instance, harvested, cut, baled, and stored and be long lasting and maintain the nutrient uh, nutrients for a long time uh, after being cut as hay. Triticale, um, another type of uh, cereal grass was actually developed in the 1800s. But um, it's really only you know, the last 20, 30 years, something like that, that, that really viable crops have been developed. The nice thing about uh, triticale is that it has a really high yield and is good for baking bread, similar to wheat, but it has the resistance to harsh climates and low soil nutrient uh, requirements of rye. And in fact, the word is a fusion of the Latin words triticum, which means wheat, and tecale, which means rye, so triticale. This gives an idea of the relative size of uh, the grains. And you can see the, the triticale grains are actually quite large. Um, not quite as large as rye, but large, as large or larger than wheat. Um, equally nutritious, and as I mentioned before, uh, very good for bread baking. Um, the uh, map gives an idea of uh, current areas of commercial production. Still quite small, especially compared to wheat or rye, but um, growing because of the hardiness of the plant. Sorghum is another type of grass. Um, this one is grown primarily for the seeds. And uh, or grain sorghum, uh, pardon me, is grown primarily for the seeds. And they're processed to produce a type of meal and, the, and after being processed can be used um, in a sweetener. Sweet sorghum is grown for the cane 
which is another word for the stem or the tiller of the plant. That's crushed in a press to extract the sap in a process almost identical to extracting uh, uh, the sap from sugarcane. Um, that sap is then boiled down um, in a process similar to uh, boiling down uh, maple tree sap to make maple syrup. In this case, the sweet sorghum sap is boiled down to make sorghum syrup. In the US, um, sorghum syrup is often referred to as molasses. Uh, it is not technically the same molasses that um, the rest of the world knows, but it's a uh, dark brown viscous syrup, um, very sweet, but with a, a different taste than sugar. So those are two types of sorghum. And here we see a grain sorghum. On the left, the kernels can be um, processed into uh, sorghum meal. Uh, they can be processed to make a sweetener, as I mentioned before. Uh, you can see they can also be popped similar to popcorn. Um, on the right is a picture of sorghum. And grain sorghum and uh, sweet sorghum appear very similar growing in the field. And they actually have sort of an overall appearance not too dissimilar from corn. The main difference that you can see is one, it's grown much closer together than corn. The stems or the canes are quite a bit thinner than corn stems. Uh, for any given height of plant, the uh, sorghum stems are going to be quite a bit thinner. And if you notice, the seed heads of sorghum are up here on top, whereas on corn, the seeds are the ears that come out down lower. So there are some differences easy to spot once you know what you're looking for in the field. Another type of grain uh, or grass plant that's grown, and this one is not grown for human consumption necessarily, though the seeds could be eaten. Um, it's grown to make brooms and appropriately enough called broom corn. Um, the story goes that uh, Benjamin Franklin brought broom corn to America um, when he was an ambassador uh, to France, um, he was very impressed with a small broom that his French hosts provided him to brush his hat. <clears throat> and uh, he carefully looked it over and found a few seeds that were still attached uh, to the broom. And he picked them off and saved them and brought them back to America and introduced broom corn to America. It grows, as you can see in the... Uh, Illustration, um, very stiff, straight, but thin canes, which can be easily um, cut, wrapped, and sewn to make brooms. Um, incidentally, Arcola, Illinois, is now the broom capital, broom corn capital of the United States, and holds a broom corn festival uh, each year in the fall. Finally, uh, genetic modification. Cereals are being modified, genetically modified, to give the plants qualities they wouldn't otherwise have. As I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> vitamin A, uh, golden rice uh, containing vitamin A, which normally it would not have. Um, other examples include um, Roundup Ready corn, which has a gene in it that makes it resistant to the herbicide Roundup, which allows a uh, farmer to use a single herbicide, Roundup, of course, um, to kill weeds in the field as opposed to having to rely on one type of herbicide to kill broadleaf weeds and then a different one to kill the uh, grassy weeds. Roundup kills both, and with the genetically modified corn, we don't have um, the Roundup that, the Roundup killing the corn itself. There's also uh, a product called BT corn, stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that normally grows in the soil, and it produces a toxin that is deadly to caterpillars. The toxin itself doesn't really affect adult forms of insects. It doesn't have an effect on uh, mammals or people or anything like that. 
Um, so it's, as an insecticide goes, it's relatively safe. It only kills the larval forms or caterpillars of insects. Um, corn has been <clears throat> genetically modified, given the gene from this bacteria that causes it to produce this toxin, so that the corn itself produces an insecticide which will kill uh, corn earworm and corn rootworm and corn borers, all of which have a larval caterpillar type stage, um, so that farmers uh, aren't, uh, do not have to spray the fields um, to control those types of insects. Um, in addition, um, genetic modifications being looked at and uh, starting to be used as a method to uh, impart uh, certain disease resistance characteristics to uh, grains. Now, I should mention at this point that genetic modification of plants for these things isn't solely limited to uh, grains or corn, as the examples I've been giving. It's just that corn being the largest crop in the U.S. Is, has been the one that's received the most attention. But these um, practices are being applied to an entire range of uh, plants, soybeans, rice, corn, wheat, uh, even uh, trees and fruit crops are beginning to receive uh, genetic modification treatments.